Okay. Yeah, I like to uh, show you something which I discovered, or not really discovered, but uh, made two years ago at my former employer. And that is compile time checking your user defined literals. If you're using user defined literals, I recommend that, by the way, try to compile time check them. And I will demonstrate that here why this is important. Um, for example, oh, by the way, if you want to look at this afterwards, here's the Godbolt link where you can find these and you can play around with that. Uh, at my former uh, employer, Benox, there we are, uh, there we did a lot of stuff with networking. And so we had our own type for IP four addresses. Uh, here's a simplified version of it. It's just a simple wrapper around a uint 32 bit um, integer. And it's, of course, it has uh, these four components for an IP address. And um, what we like to have, especially in unit tests, is very often that we wanted to write something like that instead of writing an IP address type and then somehow knowing what the hex code is for that or so that, that we get this. So we wanted to have some constants and user-defined literals is great for that. So we would define our own type here, IPv4 it's called, and you can write something like that. And that is perfect. And uh, you can also print it like that and uh, it compiles. And everything is fine, we thought. At the beginning, we, by the way, implemented this, um, the, the function signature of such a, uh, such a user-defined literal looks like that. And we implemented that by parsing this string using, I think, IO stream, um, uh, et cetera. And so everything was done at runtime. It was fine, especially at the time when we implemented the original version, which was, I think, around 2013 or so. And um, but we realized that we got some problems, especially for example, if you are uh, having something like that here, you are uh, writing uh, an IP address type which is not valid. You might know 255 is the highest number you can have for one of these four blocks here, these groups, and this one indeed is not a uh, valid IP address. And so uh, yeah, you might have other versions here, for example. Uh, you are missing one of the uh, the numbers or the entire group, or you're writing an additional group there, or you are uh, yeah, doing some nonsense like an empty string literal there, or even if you wanted to do something like that, uh, adding some extra zeros, this should be fine, but we didn't like that. And as you noticed, the compiler is compiling this happily, but if you try to uh, execute this code, you then realize, oh, uh, this is not valid. Only the first thing here is valid, uh, here, the output. But the other ones throw exceptions um, from the implementation. And um, that was not nice, because we wanted to do that at compile time. That would, be, would have been better. And luckily, later, with uh, const extra uh, simplification for const extra, we were able to do that. And it's even better with C++20 with const eval. So uh, now uh, I implemented it uh, differently that I use here some uh, parser function, which is entirely const expert or in C++20 const eval. And uh, if I encounter something which is not valid, then I throw these yeah, exceptions here. It's just a string literal so that I uh, can use it during compile time. Or oh, by the way, the throwing in from a const expression is not uh, valid, so uh, this um, cannot be evaluated during C, uh, in C17 during uh, compile time. So that's why we're getting this here at runtime. But um, for uh, C20, we, when we use that, you see, oh, it's not even compiling. And why is that? Because it evaluates this at runtime. And so I get here some nice uh, output saying, what did I do wrong? Okay, here for this one version, I threw, uh, I threw because this is uh, not a, not a valid IP address because I'm uh, have an invalid number in the group, the invalid number I had. Uh, where is it here? Two hundred fifty-six. Uh, the next one saying, oh, it's a missing number. Yeah, that's what we have here, and uh, here there's not even uh, entire group for the number missing. So the dot. Here we have some additional tokens at the end, and. For all these things, I get these uh, error messages now at run at compile time, and that's what I really want because 
although most of these things were, uh, would have been used in unit tests, we don't want to have the unit test failing just because we wrote it wrong and we want to capture uh, these errors early. So I recommend do that. Try to um, to uh, check your, your um, string literals during compile time. And if you're interested how this is done here, how I did this, uh, you can look through the implementation. As I said, the link is here. Just one note, you can even get this to uh, check during uh, compile time for C++ uh, 17. If you are uh, calling this from an um, const expression context, and this is, for example, a static assert, and uh, then you realize um, that here it's uh, complaining because this here uh, says it's not a, uh, uh, not a constant expression anymore. Why is that? Because it, I threw something from a const expr uh, function, but in the next error message, it tells me what I threw and why and what the error is. So even if you don't are not able to use C++ 20 and a const eval capable compiler, you can uh, luckily also get this if you call this from a static assert, for example. But still, it's nicer if you use C++ 20 because then you just get the important stuff there. And that's all I wanted to say. So uh, test your uh, string literals at, at compile time. And if you haven't used any, maybe you should. They are pretty cool. Thank you. Thanks. Um, yeah, my, my name is Mark Mutz. I work for the Qt company now. And I want to talk about QString, QAnyString string view, something that I did for my former employer, but it's in Qt. Um, that's a variant string view. And I want to tell you why, even if you don't use Qt, uh, you should care. So uh, in this talk, I will briefly present some history. That's basically when you download the slides afterwards that you have the links to the uh, to the blogs and uh, and uh, YouTube videos. Then we'll talk about what's there now and uh, what uh, I intend to do in the future. So all this started with the introduction of QStringView in 2017 and Qt 510, um, which is basically the QString version of standard StringView. And there was a series of blogs and talks about that. Um, and in uh, meeting C++ 17, I also did a lightning talk called the most important API design principle question mark that introduced a non-owning interface idiom, uh, version one back then. And uh, at this meeting C++, I did a talk called coroutines as an API principle and that introduced uh, NOI version two. And all these feed into um, the notion that um, you should not use owning containers in the API. You should use views if you can, otherwise coroutines are, are an option. So with that, um, let's see what uh, we have in Qt at the moment. So QStringView and uh, assorted classes in Qt 6. Um, we have merged QString tokenizer um, that's basically a C++11 uh, implementation of a coroutine to split strings um, with quite some interesting features. Qlatin1 string has uh, magically survived, uh, even though it was scheduled to be removed, but um, uh, we still have it because Latin1 is still um, important encoding. You can't do everything in UTF-8 uh, uh, because UTF-8 has uh, variable length encoding, so you can't get the length of a string um, in, in characters, in uh, code points, whatever that is, um, easily. And a uh, Latin one string has this property and uh, US ASCII as a subset of that is too important to just let it go. We have a UTF-8 string view too now, and we have QAnny string view. And this is what I want to talk uh, to you about. So what is QAnny string view? QAnny string view is a variant string view type. Think standard variant of the aforementioned three views, Q string view, Q Latin one string view, uh, it should be called, but for legacy reasons it isn't, and uh, Q UTF-8 string view. Yeah. So whatever you pass to it, um, it will figure out automatically what the encoding is. Um, that's easy for conscar 8 t stars. That's UTF-8, obviously. Q Latin 1 string is Latin 1. 
and cuts car stars for uh, for legacy reasons. For that's just a cute policy that uh, UTF-8 is the default encoding. So everything that's in car stars, byte arrays, etc., is encoded as UTF-8 or interpreted to be in UTF-8. And car 16T, cons car star, uh, Q car star, and so on, they are UTF-16. Unlike QStringView, you can also construct a QAnyStringView string view from a single character um, that was deemed too magic uh, for by at the time that QStringView was added. Um, because of course, uh, as soon as you um, pass a Q uh, character to a string view and you just store the string view and don't immediately pass it to a function, it becomes invalid. Um, because internally, of course, you take the address of the argument and store it in the string view, and that you can only do when you immediately pass it on to a function and not when you store it in a local variable. So extending that further, any string view can now even take car 32t and decomposes that into a two-character um, sequence for UTF-16, because car 32, UTF-32 uh, is not supported by Qt. Um, that is also a policy decision policy decision. And you can even uh, construct it from a QString builder to expression template. Um, we have this expression templates that uh, con if you concatenate uh, strings and you uh, set the correct um, command line options, uh, compiler flags, um, then you get an expression template uh, out of that and you only get a final string constructed once you assign it to an actual string. Um, that should work, but I just got a bug report this week uh, that it doesn't. <laughs> so uh, I need to look what, what's wrong there. So um, here's how to use QAnyStringView, string view, for example, in, in a function called set object name, which traditionally has taken a Q string uh, by const ref, like so many things in Qt. Um, and if you look at the line three, four, and five in the upper block there, um, the first two are allocating. And the third one is a statically constructed instance of a Q string, so it does not allocate, but it uh, returns uh, from a nested lambda inside that um, macro Q string literal uh, a temporary Q string whose destructor are then run and all the funny atomic operations that Q string copies um, perform. So if we just change this uh, in the API to any string view, disregarding how that looks in the implementation at, for the moment, um, we can now pass the same things and what was allocating before no longer allocates because any string view is just a view and it's accepting anything. It's accepting UTF-8 in the first case, Latin 1 in the second, and even QStrings. Um, that is now a pessimization because you still have the temporary QString. If you would just write uh, U, uh, car 30 car 16 t literal um, you would not get the temporary q string insertion there and less code being executed at um, at call time in the caller so unlike q string view um, uh, q any string view was not designed to be overloaded with q string um, it is uh, designed to replace q string and any other overloads for any other string like types um, yeah, so at the moment, QString, any string has very little API. You basically, uh, it accepts everything. So it's, uh, it's there for its constructors. And then when you want to go in, um, you need to use visitation, like with a standard variant. Um, here's an example of how this looks. Um, and the goal here was to replace all that overload sets that we have in Qt with a QString view, QCAR, QLatin1 string, UTF-8 string, const car star, and so on, and uh, just replace that overload set with the single function that takes QAnyStringView. string view. And then only in the implementation, farm out into uh, level uh, Latin 1, UTF-8, and UTF-16 implementations. The way this looks here is um, that basically um, you get uh, any string view in, and then you call visit on it, passing a lambda, and then you can do the processing in there. And uh, this auto name variable will either be a QLatin1 string or a QString view or a QUTF16, uh, a QUTF8 string. Um, and then you can just do the thing. Here we just call to string, um, which returns a QString from all of these views. And since that is so common, that's already an API on QAnyStringView. 
So if all we do is uh, building a queue string, why take a queue any string in the first place? There are several reasons. First, um, we have now one place in the library um, behind the API boundary where the queue string is being constructed, as opposed to at the call side with a temporary queue string object, which litters every call side um, with a queue string construction and a memory allocation. Um, which does the same thing as a sequence of executable assembler instructions, but of course it uh, it's duplicated for each caller. Whereas if you take if you do this in the library, you only have a single place where this is being done. Second, we have now gained that the implementation no longer is forced to store the thing as a queue string, but it can, for example, store it in a U16 um, string, standard U16 string to get uh, the SSO, so small string optimization or in some small small vector in Qt that's called QVAR length array. So, um, or maybe you're even pre-processing the string anyway, and you would anyway cause a detach from that uh, from the Q string that you're being passed. Um, like for example, in Q settings, we have this uh, key um, that you can look up and there's an actual pre-processing step. And so uh, we don't actually lose anything because we anyway create a queue string and clean up the key before passing it to the backend. So um, if all we do, yeah, or maybe you're just parsing and not storing at all. And if Qt is so far away from your day work, then um, just look at the basic F stream seaters constructors lately, and you will understand that the standard library has the same problem. So that's the present. Uh, what about the future? Um, I will skip that because I'm short in time. Um, I just wanted to show this here as the end slide um, for Jens because we were talking uh, in the in the Q and A about this. Um, this is um, how to um, format numbers uh, using the new standard two cars um, function that we got in C plus plus seventeen. But uh, with have, without having to set up a buffer first manually, you, we're using the CSS idiom, the compiler, uh, the scholar supplied storage idiom, um, to get a buffer into which we then format the data and then we return it as a, a Latin one string. And uh, since we return a Latin one string, we're automatically compatible with all the Qt infrastructure. And with that, I thank you. Okay, thank you, Mark. We are ready to get started. Take it away. So, um, meeting C++ does not have the famous quiz this year, but it has its own special Squid Game edition. I'm your front woman for tonight. We're going to have five games. The goal is to find the value of the return. And I will give you a chance to actually win the game if you, um, because there are three answers for you to choose from. It's okay if you haven't watched the show, um, the questions are not Squid Game related. And a bonus tip, if you can remember some details from the code, you might be able to guess the right answer. If you're wrong, you're eliminated, um, which in this case means that you're out. So, um, ready or not, first game starts now. Get your answers ready. You have three possibilities. The right one was TMP. Everyone who didn't got the right answer is out now. Sorry. Let's go to game two. And we start.
time is up. Choose your answer. The right one was struct. So again, everyone who didn't got the right answer is out now. And let's go over to game three. And we start. Time is up. And the right answer was array. We're going over to the next game. And Time is up. Get your answer. The right one here is float. And we move on to the last question. And Time is up for the last game. And the last answer is any of. Congratulations to all the winners. You're probably uh, wondering what you won. Um, I'm very sorry, I don't have any money. Thanks for playing anyway and follow me on Twitter. I thought I'd give a quick talk on butterflies and C++, which is basically, you know, a follow up on my last lightning talk at meeting C++ 2019. And maybe you remember back then I told you I would be, you know, taking nice pictures of butterflies. And I've been doing this uh, since then, more or less, but also, I had made the decision that I wanted to do more than nice pictures. I wanted to contribute to the effort of conservation. And so I started with monitoring conservation and um, yeah, being involved in this field. And this has been an awesome journey and it's actually too long to give a lightning talk on, so I will you know, limit myself to it, to showing you some pictures and explaining you uh, what this has to do with C++. Now, first, in the monitoring tours, I do monitor every species, uh, but there are two species which are special. This is the first one, um, which already was here on the other slide. Uh, this is uh, the Grayling or Ockerbinneger Samtfalter of Deutsch, uh, which is a very threatened species because this is a species which lives in heath and needs open sand in uh, the landscape, which is very rare in our nowadays. So uh, this is one of the of the rare species which flies in my county. And I am more or less with the last years trying to see where they where everywhere, like where, where do they fly? You know, like this is this is my job in the monitoring 
uh, to to track them down and to see how, how many can I find of those butterflies. And these are kind of hard to find if it's not like on uh, on a heath or on, on um, other blooming plants. Um, and the second species I am looking for is of Deutsch Declan Eisvogel, or in English, uh, the White Admiral. And um, this is a butterfly which is not in the in the heath. It's a butterfly which is more in the forest and more in the uh, moist parts of a forest. So it's uh, you know close to rivers. And um, one of the projects I'm like next year I'm going to start because during the pandemic I have not been as much on the lakes. I will look in the lake uh, districts where I usually uh, take other pictures uh, during this winter if I find this butterfly there too, um, because that is still an unexplored corner of my uh, county for this butterfly. And yeah, this butterfly flies only during summer and the other species also, it's just a few weeks. Um, but then of course you always need to be a bit lucky to find those butterflies. Um, like for example, this is uh, basically like a hundred or 200 meters away where I did find a different a blueling species two years ago, and I haven't seen it since. And there I found this uh, couple, and back then it also was a couple, but this is a different species. This is Argus blooding, and Argus is kind of the the uh, Latin name also. So it's I'm not sure what the the English name is. Uh, Bloodings are not like my specialty. Those English names, but then also, and here it gets now interesting. I take pictures like that. I am in monitoring mode, and monitoring is has changed my habits on what I take for pictures. I take pictures of every single butterfly I, I see. I count them. I track that in an app uh, called Observation, and um, for that, I kind of you know try to have images, which uh, then you know I later load up uh, into the website. And for that, I cut out the butterfly itself because the, the image itself is too big. And uh, then you, you have a result like this, which of course you know that's not a picture you took because it's a pretty picture. That's a picture because I you know was documenting the species was here, and that's part of the work I do. And uh, this is. Um, for like over time, this work becomes valuable. So if I do it every year, and other people do it every year, uh, the the collection of the data is very important for conservation efforts. Um, and so I began asking myself, does STD find find butterflies? And I'm not sure yet. Um, but I have a friend which is also concerned about. Uh, SCD find, and so we're investigating that. Um, but for for now, um, I plan, you know, to to use C plus plus to to write something, which um, makes my job a bit easier. The the monitoring, another another uh, example here. In the monitoring I get home in summer after a long day of uh, like hiking for like six hours sometimes. And I have like 50 to 80 pictures of butterflies. And I don't want to edit them all by, by myself manually anymore. I want to have a program which does exactly this job. I want uh, some, some um, image recognition and I have an example for that which trains something and then uses that. And I want to uh, kind of you know put that in a cute program, and uh, make that as open source and kind of you know kind of work maybe with, with some of the folks at me C plus plus online um, together to have a little bit of fun there, and then have uh, a little bit less work with pictures in summer. Um, and uh, I got uh, also part of this work is caterpillars, and I'm not sure if, like if that software also will, would be able to handle caterpillars. But uh, that's another field where I have, you know, been very active this year because I got a macro lens, and with a macro lens, I suddenly am able to document them, and suddenly I keep seeing them. And for the uh, monitoring, uh, a lot of species I found for moths uh, through the caterpillars, and this is, I think, one of the best finds in this year. This is a very rare species. 
which also hadn't been found in that corner for, for a few years. And um, I hope to be able to see and find this again next year and maybe to find out a bit more about uh, how, how big the population of that uh, moth in that corner is. Um, this is a very, very uh, easy to find, not easy to find caterpillar, but this is a more in the he's uh, the um, emperor moth or kleines Nachtfrauenauge of Deutsch. It's very, uh, you can fly, see them flying the butterfly, the, the moth fly in, 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 the, in the dawn in um, April, sometimes already in March, depends on the weather. And uh, the caterpillar, it's like really, really uh, well hidden in the heath. But once you know have an eye for it and you keep looking in the heath, you you, you keep finding them. They're, they're kind of way more often than other caterpillars in the heath. Um, and then um, in July, I heard the voice of a bird on one of the areas where I'm actually monitoring butterflies. And it was directly like for me clear that this could be the species, a European bee eater. And that piqued my interest to, to, to get a good picture of that bird. And I would not have dreamed to get this picture because this picture is also with a, a rare butterfly, which is hard to, to find for monitoring purpose. Um, and so to, to basically kind of get it delivered by air. Uh, that, that's, that's awesome. That's, that's one, I think one of the best pictures I took this year. And um, yeah, I, I'm going to just end with this picture. And uh, this is basically what I do now for butterflies. I will you know, have a bit of uh, more pictures and uh, probably a talk which I prepare for that to uh, you know, uh, make this a project where people can help us and we can like, you know, uh, build something which helps with monitoring there. And um, 